Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. May you all experience God in a very real sense today as we come together to worship Him. Ndia nibulisa nonken gegama lenkosi yetu u Jesu Christu. Akrutila alkinarino van Jesus Christus. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This week we only have one birthday on our membership list and that is on the 21st, it's Audrey Slaughter's birthday. So happy birthday Audrey and everybody else also celebrating a birthday this week. May you have a super duper special day and may you feel God's presence around you in this here ahead. We're going to start our service by listening to the hymn, Thine Be the Glory. to worship this morning comes from Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 and it reads as follows. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. As we come together this week we each come in our own way. Perhaps the past week was challenging and we need God's help. Perhaps it was a great week and we want to come and give thanks. Perhaps we are worried about something that's going to happen this week coming and we want to come and ask God for his guidance. Or maybe we are excited for the week ahead and we want to come and share that excitement with God. This morning the Lord stands with his arms wide open. He's ready to hear, ready to listen, ready to guide, ready to celebrate, ready to be joyous with us. For we trust him and we know that he is the one who makes our paths straight. So let's therefore draw near to our Lord, our God, by coming to share with him what's on our minds, on our hearts, as we focus our attention on him with silent and individual prayer. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we come before you this morning because we want to worship you. We want to give you all the gl glory and honor that you deserve. Nothing is too small for you to care about. Nothing is too great for you to help us with. You are amazing and awesome. You know us inside out and upside down and still you love us. You know our faults and our weaknesses and still you call us. You know our darkest secrets and still you welcome us with open arms. Your grace knows no end. Your faithfulness knows no end. Your love knows no end. And for this, we come to worship and praise you. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for all you do, small and big, weird and wonderful, slow and silent. Thank you for being our God. We know, Lord, that we often let you down. We have our moments of weakness where we gossip or lie, where we say the wrong thing at the wrong time without sometimes even knowing it. The moments our selfishness and pride gets the better of us. The moments we act in anger and hatred. Lord, come and show us where we went wrong this week. Come and make us aware of where we let you down. Search our hearts as we come before you now to silently and individually confess our sins to you. Lord, hear our confessions. You know whether we truly repent. You know whether we truly feel guilty. You know what it is we did that needs your grace and mercy. Let your forgiveness flow over us now. Wash us clean in your blood. 
Lord, we know you promise us that when we truly repent, you forgive. You separate our sins far away from us. You throw them in the deepest oceans. You turn the other cheek. And you grant us yet another chance. Your grace and mercy knows no end. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us with a love that will never let us go. As we come to worship you this morning, be with us. Help us to experience you. Open our hearts and our minds to you. Help our actions to be in line with your will. Help us to recognize and answer your call. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now are going to listen to the hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. today comes from the Old Testament from the book of Judges, Judges 7 verse 1 to 8 and I'll be reading from the NIV translation and you're more than welcome to read along with me. So Judges 7 verse 1 to 8 and here we read the following. Early in the morning Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength had saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. And there the Lord told them, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands and their mouths. All the rest got down onto their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. And here ends our reading this morning. May the Lord bless to us the understanding of his holy word. The book of Judges is a really, really awesome book and it's filled with really cool stories. But before we get into that, it's important for us to know and to know a few things about this book. Firstly, what we need to know is that this book is known as the book of chaos. 
And the reason people refer to it as the Book of Chaos is because it's in a time of Israel's history where everything was uncertain. For a few years, there would be a leader and the Israelites would then turn away from God. God would punish them, they would repent, a new leader will emerge. But it's not long before the people then again turn away from God. Again, he will punish them. Again, they will repent. Again, God will send someone. And so the history continues over and over, time and time again. Because this happens over and over again, it shows us that the hand of God is in Israel's history, even at times when it felt to them as if God wasn't close. Secondly, what is unique about this book is that it consists of stories that the elders used to tell the children around the campfire. So it would be tales told with enthusiasm, with a few inside jokes, so that the children would laugh and they'd enjoy the story. But these stories had a very important function. It taught and it educated the young children while reminding the older people that God is ultimately the one who is in control. He will provide. The specific, the specific story we then read today is a story about a man named Gideon. And the story of Gideon is perhaps a story that we are all familiar with. We've heard the story when we were children, we've heard sermons on it while we were adults, and perhaps it's a passage we are now reading to our children or our grandchildren. The story of Gideon begins in chapter 6. And here we read that the Israelites did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord yet again, and God gave them over into the power of the Midianites for seven whole long years. And what we read tells us that life under the Midianites were difficult for the Israelites. They were treated badly. Their dwellings were repeatedly broken down and they eventually just lived in caves. When they planted some crops and the time came for harvest, then the Midianites would come in and they would take the harvest for themselves. If Israel managed to get some cattle or sheep or goats together, that would also be taken away from them. So they had nothing for themselves. And whatever they managed to get together would be taken away and destroyed. And this left them in total and utter despair. After experiencing this for a few years, the people then called out to God. They repented. God heard their cries and their confessions and he answered their prayers by sending them Gideon. But when God called Gideon initially, Gideon wasn't very impressed with God. He questioned the angel of God, stating that God did all these wonderful things for the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. He did all these wonderful miracles or rather that's what he was told by his parents and his grandparents. But where was God now? Now that the Israelites were suffering under the Midianites, where is God? After all, it was God's choice to give Israel over into the power of the Midianites. And here there's a very deep and long discussion that takes place between the angel of the Lord and Gideon. And this is where that well-known story comes from where Gideon keeps on keeps on asking for confirmation with a piece of wool and three times God then answers Gideon. Only then do we come to the story that we read together this morning. God has now called Gideon. Gideon has accepted his call and now we read what Gideon does through the power of God. In verse 1 we find the word Jerob Baal. This was the name the people gave to Gideon. It meant Baal's enemy. My gran always used to say, one's name always goes out ahead of you. And this is what was true for Gideon. Because one of the first things Gideon did was to go in the night and break down the altar that was built to, for the Baal. Gideon had a reputation. A reputation of someone that stood up and against Baal and his followers. In verse 2, God comes to Gideon to tell him that he has too many soldiers. What a strange thing for God to say. Because in chapter 6 verse 5, we read that the Midians were like a swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. Now, if one couldn't even count their camels, 
they had to be a huge army. One would think Gideon needed all the help he could get. He needed an army. Gideon only had 32,000 men, which is really little in comparison to the great Midianite army. However, God tells him there's too many and he needs to make the army smaller. So Gideon makes the announcement that those who are scared and fearful can go home. 22,000 men turn around and leave, leaving Gideon with an army of 10,000. But then in verse 4, God comes again saying, it's too many. Seriously? First Israel had 32,000 men to fight with. Now they only have 10,000. And still God wants this army to be smaller. And they are fighting against an army where one cannot even count the camels. Can't go well. But Gideon listens and he takes the 10,000 men to a little stream so that they can drink water. And then he judges them on how they drink the water. Now for us to understand this judgment, we need to understand something about the time. The Israelites of that time had a big problem with idol worship. People would make their own idols, worship them by kneeling and bowing in front of them and hiding them away in their tents. But those who stayed faithful to God refused to bow down in any way or form because they associated it with idol worship. So when the soldiers were asked to drink water, those who were used to bowing, bowing down because they had idols hidden away in their tents, they would automatically do this action and they would bow down to drink the water. An action a true follower of God would never do. So Gideon takes these men to the stream to, do, to drink water, an everyday activity or so it seems, something they do without thinking. And here the test then comes. He keeps an eye on the men to see how they drink the water. And those who bowed down, he had to let go. Now something else that's very interesting. In verse 5, we read that those who lapped the water up like a dog were the ones that were chosen. Why is this important? Remember, it's a story that was told to children around a campfire and often there were little inside and private jokes. At that time, there was a folk tale that was also told to the children. In Egypt, there were many dogs. But the dogs soon realized that in the water was a deadly enemy, Mr. Crocodile. So the dogs were clever. They knew that if they stood at the edge of the river or the stream to drink water, the crocodiles would catch them. So they adjusted and the dogs would run at the edge of the stream in the water and, the run, and as they run, they would drink and lap up the water. But one day there was a crocodile that slept on the bank of the river with his mouth open and a dog crept into his big mouth and killed the crocodile from inside. Now this is a story all the children knew. Due to this story, a dog was seen as a brave and a wise creature. The men who lapped the water like a dog were immediately associated or seen as being courageous, brave and wise. And therefore, they would have all the skills needed to meet the enemy and win. These men were only 300. Only 300 was chosen to go into battle with Gideon from the original 32,000. So at the beginning, we've got 32,000, which was already a small number against the great Midianite army. And now Gideon only has 300. I wonder if these 300 men started wondering what is God's plan? How is it possible that 300 men will defeat the massive Midianite army? But at the end of the day, God chose these 300 in a very special manner. God knew that with those 300 men, Gideon will have the right fighters at his side, the brave and the intelligent. And God also knew that with these 300 faithful followers, the Israelites 
will place their trust completely in God instead of in their own capabilities. And this brings us to the crux of our reading today, trusting God. Trust is a very difficult thing for us to do. Throughout our lives, we are so often let down by people we really trust. And the more this happens, the more difficult it becomes to trust again. We begin to understand that at the end of the day, the only person that will be there for us is me, myself and I. And then before we know it, we try and do everything in our own way and by our own strength. Sometimes we succeed and we pat ourselves on the back and other times we don't succeed. And then we either just give up or we try even harder, sometimes with little to no success. And before we know it, we become despondent and angry little people. Our reading today comes to remind us that we cannot do anything without God's help. We cannot do anything out of our own capabilities. Everything we have is grace. Everything we can do is grace. Every moment we share is grace. God knew that with the 300 faithful men, this small army will have to put all their trust in God. Because without God, they wouldn't have gotten very far. Without God, they would have died at the hands of the Midianites. God chose these 300 men in a special way to show and reveal his power to the enemies of Israel, but also to those who follow God, so that they can see God is real. He does have everything in his hands and he knows what he's doing. Each one of us, we've been called by God. Each one of us, we have a role to play in his kingdom. Each one of us will also go through times of testing, like these men did at the stream. Times where our actions will really show what we believe, what we think, and who we follow. And often this will happen in small ways that we don't even notice. Our daily actions, the way we behave in the car when another car cuts in front of us, the way we behave when we have to stand in a very long queue that's not moving and we are irritated, the way we speak to the car guard or the teller at the bank, the way we act every single day is what people see. And it is these actions, our everyday actions, that might be very small and insignificant, but they reveal who we serve. Most of all, this story reminds us that every day when we wake up, we need to make a conscious effort to place our trust in God. God knows all things. He has all the power. It is our God who will keep us in the palm of his hand when we are anxious and when we are scared. It is our God that will guide us in making the right decisions at the right time. It is our God that will use all the bad things that happen to us for good. It is our God that loves us with a love that will never let us go. God has shown us over and over and over and over again that we can trust him. We know that this is true. We know that he is dependable, trustworthy and faithful. We know that he will never let us down. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to thank you for all the times that we could just trust and obey you. We thank you for all the times that you showed up, all the times you guided, all the times you helped, all the times we felt your presence and knew that you had everything in control. Lord, you know how often we are scared and anxious, how often we are worried, how often we look for you and we don't always see you. Lord, you know the challenges we face and the difficulty we have to trust. God, remind us of those times you were there. Remind us of those times where we depended on you and you showed up in a very real way. Lord, help us that every day, every moment, we will place our trust in you. Thank you, Lord, that we know 
that you will never abandon us. You will never test our trust. You will always show up and always reveal yourself. Lord, be with us in this week. Reveal yourself to us. Help us to experience you. We pray, Lord, for all those in our congregation, all those who are friends and family of the congregation, all those who are your followers in this world. Lord, be with them this week. Hear their prayers. Grant them peace. Grant them healing. Grant them love. Grant them help. Grant and provide for them for all their needs. Lord, thank you that we can come to you. Thank you that we can depend on you. Thank you that we know you are our God, the all-powerful and almighty. Lord above all lords. Amen. We are now going to listen to the hymn, Trust and Obey. Balo lenko si yetu u Yesu Kristu utando lukatiko obutlelwana lo moyo uyenkwele malube nani nonke in nou magi genade van Christus die liefde van God in die gemeenskap van die Heilige Gees met alken van jelle wees en bly and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and all those whom we love now and forevermore Amen. May you have a blessed week ahead.